I'm super excited to get to welcome Bethany. Um, Bethany actually overlapped at Google a bit. She's an incredibly talented designer and now manager at Google, uh, working on the material design systems team. And she is a self-taught UX practitioner, studied product design and mechanical engineering at Stanford. And she's worked on all kinds of things at Google, like Android, Android TV, accessibility, and was early on in the material design team all the, all the way back in 2013. And so super excited to welcome her uh, to hear about motivating design system adoptions at scale. Welcome, Bethany. Oh yeah, my first design job. Um, I'm gonna go all the way back to first grade um, when I was tapped to design the cover of our first grade book, which I guess first grade classes do that. And I decided to hand cut all the typography for the cover and I got criticized for it by this boy who was sitting next to me, but I finished on deadline. So it has all the elements of a classic design job. There's a deadline, there's craft, and there's mansplaining. So that's it. Um, okay, so hi, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I am thrilled to be talking to you about something that I have been eating, breathing, and sleeping over the last two years, and that is design system adoption. And so um, what I hope that you're going to walk away from this talk with is a framework to understand your internal audience. Um, I'll be sharing plenty of examples from what we did at Google. And um, this is what I hope will be the result. You've got limited time and money, and you want your design system adoption to go up and to the right. Um, so I'll tell you about some of the tools that we've used at Material Design. Uh, so where am I coming from? Material Design is a group, a design systems group, does redesign Google twice over in the course of five years. Is that wise or not? Maybe. Um, but we've also open sourced our design system for anyone to be able to use. And so we first launched in 2014 with a robust and bold set of components and guidelines. And it was a hit. We had surprisingly millions of Android apps and web apps and some iOS apps that were using our guidelines within just a few years. And this is what our context looked like at the time. Uh, we had a Google-wide initiative, which was largely mobile focused. You can see the call out to Android and the OKR. Um, there are around 700 UXers at Google, which sounds like a lot, um, but just wait for a couple slides. Uh, we had around 60 products to redesign, and we gave them about five months to do it, and they did. And we drove this all as a small group of about 30 designers, all UXers. Um, personally, I was a junior designer who was tasked to design all of the components, which boggles my mind that they let me do that. Um, but the ecosystem keeps developing, right? We've heard a lot about design systems dealing with change today. And so as we introduced material, things changed. Um, so you can look at material design's range of expression in 2014 like this. It was uh, given a certain bounds to work with. And, and Google really quickly took up, took up that full range of expressiveness. So it made it really hard for third-party products to look right, to look branded within our system. So you had ended up with a lot of apps that looked like this. This is a real third-party email client on Android, and this was it sitting next to Gmail. And um, can you tell which one is which? No, I can't. Um, that red is really helpful. Um, so this isn't good for anyone, right? Uh, we want to be able to express ourselves designers. Uh, brands need to ex uh, differentiate themselves in the marketplace. So to solve for this in 2018, uh, we released an updated set of guidelines and components and this new concept and tool set called material theming. And with that, we were able to carve out our own niche of expression while still leaving room for third-party builders. Um, so material theming allows designers and developers to use a codified system of expression using type, color, and shape um, that are built into components in order to ex increase the range of expression possible with material design. And these are all sample apps that we created as a design team. It was a really fun exercise, just pushing the bounds of what our system can uh, create. And um, over the course of these years, we realized that just creating design guidelines wasn't going to be possible for the amount of change that we wanted to create. So uh, we started hiring a lot of engineers, and we now support really robust component libraries on these four platforms as well. So now, with Material, this third-party email brand X can ex express itself, and Gmail can look a lot more googly. 
So we developed a Google-specific version of material theming with our own set of guidelines and components and tooling and made that available to the company in 2018. And shout out to Damien and Corral and Phil Cow for being the visual designers who led this. And then here's how our context changed from 2014 to 2018. We again secured a company-wide mandate, um, but there were now 3,000 UXers to get on board, 150 products. Uh, we gave people much longer to redesign, in part because we we're also supplying the engineering components, and so now you have to fit that into their pipeline too. And our team has quintupled in size. Uh, we've also took on the Google Fonts team now. Um, and in 2018, I got to lead the Google-wide effort to bring ba brand back into our apps as a design lead and manager. And again, I'm still in dis disbelief that I got to do that too. So how did we not get this reaction the second time around? Um, although in some parts of Google, it was kind of a close call. And instead, we heard quotes like this from throughout the company. And this is still like a year out from uh, Google Material launching. Um, so I'm going to tell you about our tool set and how we structured our processes to hit our admittedly audacious goals. So let me introduce you to the motivator map. So we consider ourselves to have two layers of users, and I think all of you do too. The makers who use our product and, of course, the end users who digest it. And for the sake of this discussion, let's consider that your primary users are the makers at your company. And this doesn't just include your designers and developers, but anyone who has a hand in the eventual success of your product and how your design system gets expressed out in the world. Um, so that's PMs, TLs, decision makers, execs. Um, so how can we break apart this blob of users and go a little bit more deeper and specific? So let's start with sentiment. Um, people come to your design system with a variety of sentiments, right? From negative to positive, skeptical to enthusiastic. And they may have had a bad history with it, or they just don't know anything about design systems, or maybe they are super excited to, to start working on it. You've encountered, oh, missing emojis, interesting. Um, you've encountered all these people, and uh, you probably have faces in mind as you look at this spectrum. You're like, yeah, that person is that person who emailed me yesterday really angry about the design system. So now let's add a vertical needs axis on top of this. Um, let's map out our audience according to if they have very common to very unique needs. An example of a common need is the good old button. Everyone needs a button, no matter how large or small your product is. Um, but a unique need might be more of a unique circumstance. So um, a product might be in the middle of a refactor, or they're, they're addressing an experimental market in a very particular way. And, um, these may be things that only one or two product or feature groups at your company is going through. This is really useful for looking at situations where you're working to adopt at scale because now you can identify patterns of behavior that group multiple teams together. And you're not always addressing people on a one-off basis. And in fact, we found this breakdown uh, generally follows the 80-20 rule. Uh, more people tend to be above the line than below. Uh, more people tend to have common needs than not, which makes sense, right? We've all heard of this before as designers. So instead of that blob of everyone that you're feeling stressed out that you have to cover, we can map out more of our audience according to the four audience segments. I'm going to go and zoom into each one of these. This is a very classic two-by-two two way of analyzing a surface. So let's start with the advocate. Upper right, it's an intersection of common needs plus an enthusiastic sentiment. And some characteristics of these folks are that they're self-motivated. They already know the value of design systems. They could be an early adopter. Um, they're generally part of a well-balanced team. Like they have a good ratio of designers to engineers on their team. And they're ready to capitalize on all the improvements that you know a design system can bring to a product. They take your work and they run with it. And um, the way that I approach them is with relief and mutual enthusiasm. They get it. Um, and you're just happy to shake their hand and have them, use your, have, have, have them use your stuff. And so for the advocate, these are the sorts of tools that you should be providing them. And these are the very bread and butter of design systems, things that you're probably already providing. Um, so beautiful design guidelines. Uh, they do a lot. They, they speak when you can't be in the room component libraries, really great research studies to back up the assertions you're making, 
sticker sheets and tooling to work things directly into the workflow of your users. Um, and then educational resources. Is there any onboarding or code labs or design labs that you're providing? Um, so we've provided all of these as well. Um, this is an example of our external uh, design guidelines. We have an internal web page as well. Uh, we have a sister catalog page that controls um, and describes all of our uh, component libraries. Good old sticker sheets. We've also started using Figma too. Um, and then we've recently started putting tutorials on Glitch, which is a really fun experimental platform, um, teaching people how to use material and how to theme with material. And this is actually available to the public if any of you want to play around with it. And so the thing to note is that people up and to the right, really up and to the right, become evangelists and contributors back to your system. They will go and tell other people about how great your design system is, which is awesome. So an example with us is actually the Google Photos team. Um, they adopted it, they got on stage with us and talked about their process. And so the next couple of slides are actually directly from one of the presentations that they gave with us last year. So they had a fantastic launch throughout 2018. Um, Android and iOS was earlier in the year, they hit web by end of the year. And this is how they told the story of GM to their engine PM partners. They pointed out the easy on-ramps, like um, use of open search was something they were already doing. They already took this build from light approach. But then um, they also pointed out some areas of improvement. So um, use of colored headers, non-branded colors wasn't really a thing for the design team. Um, and then they also pointed out the components and the type scale that they wanted to pull in to bring better clarity to the product. And they helped us reinforce the whole company-wide mandate thing, which I'll get to later. And so these were opportunities outlined by the photos team themselves to get them to adopt GM. And they were really successful, ultimately. So they pointed out things um, that we all know, but it's great to hear that a product team kind of repeating back to us, unifying patterns, streamlining design process, informing back to us, getting to be part of our process, and of course, eng cleanup. And because they were so on top of our work, including our libraries, they got to be one of the first to adopt Dark Theme, which we launched this past year, and we feature them on the Google Design blog. So this was awesome. So let's slide over to the less enthusiastic side, the dubious. Um, some characteristics of these folks are that they're unconvinced about the value of design systems. They may just need a little bit of education. Um, they can range from just neutral to I heard bad things about design systems. All those um, kind of myths that we saw listed out about design systems destroy creativity or they are job killers. Um, these people may be busy with feature work. They just don't see the value of adopting a design system right now. And so I found the way to approach them is to listen, always listen, um, and then inform them and convince them with data. So this is a toolkit that I use with these folks. Um, a good old FAQ is actually really easy to produce. It's basically a Google Doc. Um, we created a 14-page FAQ when we launched Google Material, put everything we knew onto that doc, and it actually got a lot of uh, hits during our first week of launch. Um, we've also created a business case for design systems, so we've put a lot of research into the value of design systems itself. We've created an adoption kit for people to use our work, so um, self-serve roadmaps, research plans, integration tips, ideas for who should be on the team that integrates the design system within your product. And then we've created a self-assessment rubric, um, and I'll give you an example of that in a second. Lastly, uh, we've um, formalized our comms and feedback channels so that it's very easy for anyone to get in touch with us if they ever have questions, so they don't feel like they're just talking to a wall when they have an issue with the design system. And so this is an example of some of the research that we've produced over this last year. Um, Googlers love to be convinced by data, and so we're gonna give them that data. Um, we tell them about how design systems unlock multiple aspects of value and how you only get the next one if you actually do the other three in sequence. Um, and so this has actually been going through the company and been very, very helpful in um, convincing our partners that design systems are worthwhile investments. Um, this is an example of the adoption planning workbook that we provided. 
It's really just a Google slide template. We've asked people to copy and paste it for their own team. And you can see that we've provided a roadmap as well as literal steps that they need to go through in order to adopt to get to a successful launch. And this spreadsheet is about the opposite of a design spec, right? You think of your beautiful design spec with your lovely typography. This is not it, but this is what has made Google Material tractable to our Eng and PM partners at Google. Um, this is kind of our design spec in checklist form. And so when we asked them to adopt the entire thing at the beginning of 2018, they looked at our, I don't know, 50, 60 page spec and said, no, we're not gonna read that. This seems like a giant project. We don't wanna do it. Um, but about halfway through the year, we realized they were having this reaction and we produced um, the self-assessment rubric that listed out things in as basic a way as we could. Things like use Roboto at this size, use this type scale, use these colors. And this actually got us really far in the company. Um, it was just a way of kind of listening to our users and listening to the language that they wanted us to be speaking. Um, a side benefit of doing this is when you have self-assessment at scale, you actually get data back as to how many people have adopted your work. So we measure to the percentage point um, how, well Google how well Google Material has been adopted throughout the company. And we use that to drive our OKRs and to get budget for the next year. Um, so the thing to know is that most people honestly start here. They don't know anything about design systems. They're not sitting in this room here with us. Um, and the goal is to move them to the right with the sheer force of your data and your influencing power. So an example of how this worked for us is um, the comms team. Uh, comms team is actually a giant PA filled with many different products inside. And um, the type is small, but there's products like Phi, Duo, Dialer, Messages, and a couple more um, below the fold. And they had a very enterprising P PGM who saw all the toolkits that we provide and said, this makes it really tractable. I'm just going to make a copy of this for every single one of my teams and use this to drive it centrally from comms. And so because he did that and created this resource that seemed very comms specific, this is how comms adopted Google Material over the last year. So this is great. Um, not every product chose to use our adoption kit or our assessment, um, but we were able to get a huge swath of the company to do, to do it just because of the tools that we provided. All right, moving on to the next quadrant, the critic. Keep in mind, this is not a bad person, nor is it a negative label. They will have really valid feedback for you. Um, some characteristics of the critic are that they're really time crunched, uh, they're under extreme time and market pressure, maybe their competitor just released a feature that is like right on their heels. Um, they may be using different technology than, the, than what you're supporting. Um, or they might be very insular. They just don't really want to talk to you. Um, sometimes, but increasingly rarely, we see that people are just against the idea of design systems in practice. Um, thankfully, that seems to be dying out. And so my way of approaching these folks is to listen, of course, and be willing to compromise. So here's are some of the tools that I use with the critic. Um, executive stakeholder meetings. Is your exec chain ready to go to bat for you? Are you in that exec chain? Um, and if they're not, if they can't articulate the value of your design system, have you provided them the vocabulary to do so? Um, you can help them help move the needle for you across the org. Um, we've also used viability exploration, so entering into like a time boxed agreement for we'll give you two weeks with ample access to our engineers, and if you find that there's something that you need or you don't need, that's great. Then we'll talk about it at the end of the two weeks, but don't just let them kind of let's do a standoff for, for too many months as they try and decide. Um, I've found the idea of design debt to be a really helpful thing with uh, design systems. I'm seeing some nodding from the front row, excellent. Um, because the idea of tech debt really resonates with especially engineering executives. They don't want to go into tech debt. They know that there's going to be a costly refactor in a couple of years. So why not get ahead of that, too, on the design side? Um, we're a central org, so we have the ability to, blanch, to block launches uh, from the UX side. Use this with caution. Um, but it is a tool at your disposal if you want to use it. 
And lastly, a company-wide mandate is really handy in order to effectively escalate above somebody's pay grade. And when you do that, you get to uh, uh, voice carefully worded threats like this one to really realize this unified expression of the Google brand across all of our products. We're going to need many successful collaborations with teams throughout the company. That's my manager. He's a really nice guy. Um, and he, he means that. Uh, but also, this is saying, you've got to work with us. Um, so a critic can be really useful uh, to, well, you have to be willing to cut ties with the critic, um, including with contingencies, right? Like, don't let them off the hook forever. Or you can have them in term, in, inform your long-term roadmap. Maybe you're not ready to um, do what they're asking you to do right away. It might be a few years away, and maybe you just start a dialogue with them now about what that looks like. So an example from material design is um, enterprise UX groups were pretty reluctant to adopt Google material. And so we've refocused some of our resources on enterprise-focused strategy, as well as very specific needs. So we re just relaunched our data tables with improved accessibility this year. Um, and we've opened up a long-term dialogue with them about what else they would need from us. Um, feels very much in line with uh, the last talk on change and being open to change. All right, last quadrant, uh, the change agent. And I've heard a lot of tools already suggested today for this uh, group of people. These people may like the design system, but aspects of it aren't just right for them. They're under unique circumstances. They're ahead of the rest of the company in some technology or use case. Um, and we've found that a lot of teams actually think they're here, but they're not really here. Um, they think they're a lot more special than they are, but they're not. Um, and so the way that I approach these folks is uh, with the expectation that we're gonna learn from them, but we also need to encourage them towards the larger design system. So here's the tools that I use with them. Uh, we've set up a contribution workflow so that people can you know, feed back into the central design system. And we're also willing to go into a room and just sit down and co-design strategy with them. What do they need? What does their future look like? And how can we make that happen? Um, design sprints and workshops, everyone's favorite collaborative way of feeding into a, a, design, into a design system. Um, and then dedicated liaison relationships. We have someone who's actually assigned to each product area at Google um, from my design team. And so they will answer any questions that they have. Um, so we have someone assigned to the entire uh, ads org, the entire geo org, entire search orgs, and so on. Um, and I found that the change agent is really useful to in inform our shorter term roadmap and uh, bring in what I call attainable innovation into the design system. And so we've run so many design sprints with our teams. And I'm pretty sure every design sprint has a photo that looks exactly like this. A bunch of people just puzzled in front of a whiteboard. Um, and we actually did over 17 sprints to co-design Google material with different products with unique needs. Um, so some examples here are with the Next Billion user group to help inform what we do for our emerging markets. Uh, Gmail informed our web navigation. Google News really heavily informed our cards and our tabs on web. Uh, we looked at CGK explorations with Geo and so on. The list is really, really long. Um, we actually had a dedicated sprint master on my team to help run all these things, which is totally necessary so that you're not always kind of burning out your ICs. Um, even if they're enthusiastic about running sprints, it's a lot easier when it's someone's job. All right, so that's the motivator map for you. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about how to invest or how do, how do you think about investing in this? Um, hopefully you got a sense of this from the last 10 minutes of my talk, but none of these quadrants is bad. None, you don't wanna avoid any of these quadrants. You wanna be ready to have a conversation with anyone from anywhere on this map. Um, the vertical axis can help you determine how to devote your limited time and resources though. And um, just as, as you estimate the amount of pushback that you think you're gonna get over time, you can think, am I gonna need more common needs for most of the company? Or am I going to really have to do a lot of kind of um, fire putting out over the next couple of months? And then also looking at the sorts of people who gravitate towards each part of the quadrant. So um, I have found that team leads need to shepherd the entire thing, right? But um, 
personally handle more of the skeptical folks. Um, it's also really handy to partner with your PMs, uh, especially because they create a lot of the storytelling um, elements and the roadmaps and the tools that other teams find really tractable. Um, and I've also found that ICs tend to generally very happily create things for the enthusiastic side. They love sprinting, they love making those uh, robust design specs and so on, and that's great. Um, and of course, you're going to need a PGM or program management support to support all of the collaboration that handles or that happens across these four quadrant areas. Um, and so, of course, you want to be moving your tools up and to the right. This is also very classic two by two. So moving upwards means making your tools more self-serve. As soon as you hear that something has been useful for the lower half of this grid, consider how to scale it. Move the resources that you made from that lower half into the upper half ASAP. Um, so an example would be, we found that sprints were really useful, so we turned that into a program. And then we actually had a Google Sprint handbook that would help us set up the next sprint really, really quickly. Um, and this is what we have to do at scale, to scale at Google. You always treat every team that you come across as just the tip of the iceberg, because you know there's going to be five other meeker teams in the background um, who have the exact same problem, but for some reason just aren't reaching you. Um, and also notice that the common applications uh, or the common options have a high initial time cost, like high activation energy to make that beautiful design spec, but this really long positive emotional return. It's often easier to jump straight into some of the mitigation techniques of the lower part, um, but then it might be just more of an emotional cost over time. And so then to move people to the right, user empathy. Um, empathy turns skeptics into enthusiasts. Um, be humble. Some of the most fraught stakeholder meetings that I've ever been to were turned around simply by stating what material had gotten wrong in the past and acknowledging our mistakes. Um, I saw an entire org of thousands of people, like their roadmap got changed for that whole year just because um, someone on my team had that attitude. And that was pretty amazing to watch. Um, so where are we taking this uh, next? Where are we trending this long term? Um, as material is cycling back through um, this quadrant, looking at how our adoption has landed, um, we're now using service design, uh, which is another design discipline, uh, to analyze our full suite of offerings to understand how people and teams use all these tools over time, not just divided into segments. And so this is an example of one of the tools that we're using now. It's called a service blueprint. It can see each step of the development process laid out uh, along the top of the screen, all the way from, ooh, it's too small on every single screen, I can't read it, um, like awareness, adapt adaptation, launch, evaluation, and evangelism, um, along with the steps that people go through, um, and then the ways that our teams support, and then again, a list of tools at the bottom. Um, this is a really common methodology from service design, and we found it to be really, really helpful as we started to mature as an org. Um, one way that we've started to grow this expertise within our team is we took an IDEO course together, um, Human-Centered Service Design. It's an online course, and I actually highly recommend it. I think it starts in a day, if you want to sign up for it. Um, and then I found these two books to be really, really useful as well for learning about service design. All right, so the three takeaways that I hope you get from this talk are that, um, firstly, tools for advocates, the upper right-hand corner, really accelerate adoption. Um, they're, they're what will get your foot in the door as design system experts. But you also want to invest across the entire map and make sure that you're ready and that you're not afraid to engage with any of these other sentiments that you're going to come across. Um, and lastly, is listen. Users will tell you what they need because this is user-centered design too, just like any other design um, discipline that we've been a part of. Um, so motivation is for people. This motivator map is for people. And what I mean by that is that this map and this methodology shouldn't be used as some Machiavellian way of just getting what you want. Um, but our users have really specific needs, and we're really lucky in the design world to be in a such, such a tight feedback loop with them. Not everybody gets this. Um, and so be kind and thoughtful, empathetic, 
And uh, yeah, be empathetic about what they have to go through when adopting. They're just on the other side of the table. Um, working on building trust with each of these segments will ultimately lead to your best adoption metrics, that red line up to the right, uh, but also I think the best design system that you can make. Thank you so much.